Good morning, Bridge. It's such a pleasure to be worshiping with all of you here today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Today we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 15. You can go ahead and turn there now. We're moving on today in the story of King Saul. Just to recap on last week's episode, Saul was having trust issues. Saul didn't think God would come through, and so he disobeyed God. He tried to make things happen on his terms. And so because Saul didn't want to do things God's way, God told Saul that his kingdom would not continue, that his dynasty would end with him. Well, this week, Saul is going to mess up yet again. Once again, Saul is going to disobey God, and this time, Saul himself is going to be rejected as king. Now, while today's passage has a lot of juicy details and important events, folks, we're not just reading this to get a history lesson. Now, today's passage is extremely relevant to us today because at the root of this chapter, we find two related questions. Question number one, how does God respond to sin? And question number two, how should we respond to sin? All right, let's jump in. Reading from 1 Samuel chapter 15, starting with just the first three verses, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Chapter 15, verse 1. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, right off the bat, things have gotten complicated. I intentionally stopped us here at verse 3 because my guess is many of us just felt a moment of tension. I mean, we just said, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. But if you look at this passage, brothers and sisters, this is a hard word, am I right? In verse 3, God tells Saul to go and strike Amalek and to spare No one. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I get uncomfortable. This is a brutal, violent command. And this isn't just taking out enemy combatants. This is wiping out an entire people group. This is ethnic cleansing. Men, women, children, infants, and even livestock. And yet, as Samuel himself says in verse 1, these are indeed the words of the Lord. So what do we do with passages like these? How do we make sense of what's going on here? Well, first we have to understand who the Amalekites are and what they did. Look with me at verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. What is God talking about? Well, when Israel first came up out of Egypt, we're told that the first people to attack them were the Amalekites. The Amalekites were desert nomads. They were bands of raiders who went about on camels with their swords and they preyed on the weak, on people like Israel, who were at that time just a nation of freed slaves. People who had lived their whole lives in bondage, they were being attacked. The Amalekites had no regard for life. They didn't care about the vulnerable, and they certainly didn't fear God, or else they wouldn't have attacked God's people. And so God says this about the Amalekites in Deuteronomy chapter 25. He says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came up out of Egypt. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail. Those were lagging behind you. And he did not fear God. 
Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you and the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. God says to the Israelites, don't forget. Their judgment will come. They were attacking the weakest among you, cutting off your tail, people who were lagging behind, your women, your children, they were killing them. Don't forget. And now nearly 500 years later, the time has come. God has not forgotten. Our God is a God of justice. And so the God who gives life and who has the power and the right to take it away, this God commands Israel to execute his judgment on the Amalekites for their long history of predatory oppression. In other words, if we're asking the question, how does God respond to sin? Our first answer is that God judges sin. God judges sin. Now, this may not be on our timeline. It may take 500 years. In fact, it, we might be waiting until the final judgment day. But God will judge sin. Our God is a God of justice. And if I can throw another point in for free, if I can rock the boat a little bit, our God is a God of social justice. That's right. God does not only judge between individuals, but between groups of people and across generations. Now, that word social justice has a lot of baggage these days, but just look at the text. God judges the whole nation of Amalek. Men, women, and children for what their ancestors did 500 years earlier. That might be immediately offensive to our modern Western individualistic ears. Why should I pay for what my ancestors did 500 years ago? But the Bible tells us that we sin both individually and corporately. And so God judges us both individually and corporately. Remember that according to scripture, we all come into this world under the weight of Adam and Eve's disobedience. All of us were born under Adam. All of us have been under judgment for the original corporate sin of our first parents. In fact, this very day, we find ourselves living between two great judgments. In the first judgment, God destroyed all mankind in a great flood. All men, women, and children, except for one family, Noah's family. And in the final judgment, Jesus tells us that he himself will return to judge both the living and the dead, all men, women, and children, and make no mistake, this final judgment will be a corporate judgment. All who are found in Adam will face eternal consequences. But just as in the flood, one family will not. The family of those who have been born again, born under the second Adam, Jesus Christ. In today's passage, what we're seeing is just a small preview of that final judgment. God has chosen to show his people what is going to happen on the final day. And he's chosen to accomplish this judgment through his people, through Saul, his chosen king. So let's see what Saul does. Verse 4. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Taliam, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart. Go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep and of the oxen, and of the fattened calves and the lambs, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Well, last week, Saul was outnumbered, remember? 
He had 600 guys. And he was constantly worrying about how the battle would go. But in today's chapter, Saul has over 200,000 men. And King Saul is feeling confident. So he goes and he gets ready to do what God commanded, to execute complete judgment on the Amalekites. But then Saul gets to thinking. And he thinks, you know what? This, this seems like an awful waste. I mean, look at all this perfectly good stuff. This is valuable livestock. This is property. And why should I kill this king? Who knows? Maybe he'll be useful to me. Saul sees a strategic opportunity. He runs the numbers and he thinks, maybe God's not seeing the bigger picture. Maybe there's an opportunity here. So Saul disobeys God. Yes, he destroys all the stuff that he doesn't want, but he takes the stuff that he does. Saul sins against God. So what does God do? Look at verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Saul sinned against God. He deliberately disobeyed him. And so God says that he regrets that he made Saul king. Now, that word regret shows up four times in today's passage. And this is a very tricky word to understand. Because think about it. What does it mean for God to regret? Is God sitting at home thinking, man, you know, it really seemed like a good idea at the time, but I really shouldn't have made God Saul king. I've made a huge mistake. Should have seen that one coming. Oh, well, maybe next time. No, God isn't like that. God isn't caught off guard. He isn't surprised by Saul's disobedience. And God doesn't change his mind. He isn't one thing one day and the other thing the next day. He's not fickle or trifling. God isn't constantly reacting to events that are out of his control. After all, God knows what's going to happen before it even happens. God doesn't change. And yet, God regrets. God regrets. It looks like God's changing his mind here. At one point, God made Saul king, and now God's unmaking his king. So does God change his mind? What does it mean for God to have regret? To understand what's going on here, it helps to recognize that this isn't the first time we've seen this word. The word regret shows up for the first time in the book of Genesis, in the story of the first great judgment, the flood. Genesis 6 says this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Do you see the parallels between this situation and Saul's? Just like humanity before the flood, Saul turned from following God. And so just as God regretted making mankind, God regrets making Saul king. In other words, What's going on here with Saul is a little mini version of what went down at the flood. With both mankind and Saul, God made someone and he called it good, but they were eventually turned from him. And that's the key. In both of these stories, God is not the one who changed. Humanity was. Saul was. They changed the terms of the relationship. They rejected God. They were faithless, though God had been faithful. 
And so although God does not change, God interacts with us differently when we change. Although God knew full well that this would happen, God truly does regret making mankind, making Saul king. As we read in Genesis 6, sin grieves God. How does God respond to sin? Our first answer was that God judges sin. Our second answer is that God grieves sin. God grieves sin. So if that's how God responds to sin, how does Saul respond to his own sin? Look with me at verse 12. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. So Samuel goes out to meet Saul, and he hears that Saul has built a monument for himself. He built a statue or an arch or something, because that's what you do when you're a winner, and Saul has just won a major victory. And on top of that, remember that Saul has also just taken a bunch of the loot for himself. He's rich. He's sitting pretty. Saul is in a pretty good mood. Verse 13, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. This dude. Saul feels on top of the world. He's so happy that he has the audacity to smile and to say through his teeth, Hey, Saul, what's up? I just did what God asked. But did he? No. And Samuel's not having it. He's going to call Saul out. Listen to the rest of their conversation and, and see what Saul does. Verse 14. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They've brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and and the rest we've devoted to destruction. (laughs) Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But, but the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. What, what is Saul doing in this conversation? How is he trying to get out of this? I want to spend some time unpacking Saul's response Because what Saul does here shines a light on what all of us do when we're confronted with our own sin. On display in today's passage are just three of the many strategies that we employ that allow us to minimize sin, to treat it lightly, to excuse our own behavior and justify our sinful actions. We've talked about how God responds to sin, but how do we respond to sin? Response number one, we twist God's commands. We twist God's commands. In verse 18, Samuel reminds Saul of his mission. Saul was supposed to devote to destruction the sinners, which as Samuel points out, Saul most definitely did not do. And yet Saul insists, no, I did. I I did what he asked. I I, I got the gist of it. I, I accomplished the mission. Except Saul's version of the mission included sparing the king and taking the spoils. Saul twists God's command. And folks, this should sound familiar because this has been one of humanity's responses to sin from the very beginning. 
all the way back to Adam and Eve, our first father and mother, who received the simple command to not eat of one specific tree. Remember what happened? First the serpent, the serpent twisted God's commands. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And of course, no, that's not what God said. So Eve tells the serpent, well, God actually said we shouldn't eat of this one specific tree. But then remember what she adds? She says, neither shall you touch it lest you die. From the time of the garden, we've been twisting the commands of the Lord. Satan's been getting us to distort God's commands. We think, did God actually say I have to be 100% honest on my taxes? Or that I shouldn't sleep with this specific person? I mean, I bet God didn't actually mean what he said, especially conveniently if I don't really want to do it. Like Adam and Eve and Saul, we twist God's commands, and because of that, we so easily lose sight of the mission. Response number two, we shift the blame. Look at what Saul does in verse 21. He says, I obeyed the Lord, but the people took of the spoil. Saul is the king of Israel. He's the one calling the shots. But he realizes he's getting backed into a corner, and so he shifts the blame to the people. He says, look, Samuel, I obeyed, but the people didn't. Samuel points out to him, you think you're little in your own eyes, but aren't you the head of the tribes of Israel? Once again, this should sound familiar. Remember what our father Adam said to God. God, the, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. It's the woman's fault. She gave me the fruit. Or, you know, God, it's your fault. You gave me the woman. <laughs> Folks, when we're caught in sin, we do exactly the same thing. We say, all right, okay, so maybe I did it, but my boss is the one who put me in the situation. Or, you know, my wife wasn't really holding up her part of the marriage. Or my parents really dropped the ball in this way or that. So really, it's, it's not my fault. Like our first parents and like King Saul, we so often shift the blame to others. Response number three, we appeal to good motives. We appeal to good motives. Saul's final case at the end of verse 21 is, look, sure, okay, we didn't destroy the livestock, but that was so we could sacrifice it to the Lord. Saul's saying, look, Samuel, this would have been such a waste. Wouldn't God have been happier if we sacrificed these animals rather than just wasting them? And, you know, if we happen to get a cut of the meat, that, that'd be a win-win. Saul's trying to be practical. He's trying to be innovative. It's all for a good cause. It's for the greater good. It's, it's God, it's for you. Like Saul, Adam, and Eve ate the fruit because they believed it would open their eyes and make them like God. Remember that? And come on, how can you fault them for that? We should all want to know more about our world, and we should all want to be more like God, so surely it couldn't hurt to just eat this, this fruit. Now, do you recognize yourself in any of this? Maybe you say, I don't really have to care for the poor because you figure, you know, once I'm rich, I'll be able to give even more. And maybe you say, you know, a little white lie couldn't hurt here and there because, well, it's, it's for their own good that they don't know the truth. We always just happen to have the best of intentions. But good motives don't excuse sin. Sin done for a good cause is still sin. God doesn't want Saul to sacrifice him. He doesn't want Saul's religious piety. What does God want? Look at what Samuel says in verse 22. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Amen. 
God doesn't want our excuses or good motives or greater goods. God wants obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. If Saul had understood that, he would not have dared to go against the voice of the Lord. Rebelling against God is as bad as witchcraft and idolatry. Brothers and sisters, the call for us today is to turn from sin and instead to know God's heart, to see that he desires our obedience more than our sacrifices. To understand that saying you're a Christian, coming to church, giving your tithes, none of that means anything if you aren't really doing what God says. If throughout the week you're just living life how you want to live it. God doesn't want lip service. God wants us to present our bodies, our whole lives to him as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God in our obedience. This is what God wants. But Saul doesn't get it. Saul has proven over and over again that he does not trust God and that he doesn't want to do things God's way. And so finally, Samuel lays down the judgment at the end of verse 23, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Because you changed, God regrets. Because you sinned, God judges. Because you have rejected the Lord, he has rejected you. In last week's passage, Saul's dynasty ended. His son Jonathan lost any shot at the throne. To put it another way, if King Saul were an American president, then last week his party lost re-election. But in today's passage, in this verse, Saul himself is removed. In today's passage, Saul is impeached. Saul rejects the Lord. He thinks his way is better than the Lord's way. And so because Saul rejects God, God rejects Saul. From this point on, Saul will be a rebel king, and his throne will belong to another. It's at this point that Saul begins to understand the consequences of his disobedience. And so in verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Okay, pause. Pause. Here's the second and third time that we see that word regret. But while in verse 11, we read that God regretted making Saul king, here, confusingly, Samuel makes the statement that God does not have regret, for he's not a man that he should have regret. What's going on here? How can God both regret and not have regret? Is, is, is this an inconsistency? Is, is, is the text messed up or is Samuel wrong about God? None of the above. Samuel is God's prophet and is clearly speaking truly of God in this passage. And the human author of this passage wasn't stupid. They saw the tension here, but they purposefully included both statements, both that God regretted and that he does not regret. Once again, the key to understanding this is to recognize that the writer of 1 Samuel wants us to think back to an earlier episode. In verse 11, we were supposed to think about the flood, about how while God didn't change, humanity fell into sin, and so God regretted making man and brought down his righteous judgment. Well, here in verse 29, we're supposed to see a parallel to a different passage from chapter 23 of the book of Numbers. In that story, the enemies of Israel hire a pagan prophet named Balaam to put a curse on Israel. But but every time that Balaam tries to curse God's people, God lets him know that no such thing will happen. In verse 19, Balaam says to the enemies of Israel, look, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind or literally regret. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? In other words, 
Balaam says that God cannot be manipulated. You can't turn aside his judgment. If God wants to bless, he will bless. And if God wants to curse, he will curse. In fact, at the end of Balaam's speech in chapter 24, God has Balaam pronounce a curse on the Amalekites, who we met in today's chapter. Balaam says, Amalek was the first among the nation, but its end is other destruction. In today's passage, we see that judgment fulfilled, brought down through Saul's own army. And so now here, when Samuel quotes Balaam, Samuel is putting Saul on notice. Saul. Just as surely as God brought judgment on the Amalekites, you saw what God did to these people who God said he would judge. So too will God bring down judgment on you, Saul. In verse 10, God regrets making Saul king. Saul has gone back on his side of the agreement. He's rejected God, and so God rejects him. The regret there is like the regret of Genesis 6. It is the regret that comes when an unchanging God must judge a changing, sinful humanity. But here Saul is pleading with Samuel to change God's mind, see if there's a chance to go to to get God to change his judgment. And so Samuel says, no, Saul, you haven't changed. There's no repentance in you. You're only sorry. You're only asking me to forgive you because you're in trouble. God will not regret his judgment. He's already decided. The sentence has passed. The verdict is guilty. From this point on, Saul, your fate is sealed. As we'll see in the rest of our story, Saul tragically never quite gets it. Saul is going to struggle against God until his dying day. And even here, at the moment of judgment, Saul is still clueless. Look at verse 30. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul bowed before the Lord. Folks, Saul is not grieved by his sin. Saul is only thinking about the consequences. He doesn't want to lose face before his people. He doesn't want to be in a leadership crisis. Saul doesn't want to get in trouble. So for the second time, Saul begs Samuel to return with him to make it look like Saul is still cool with God. And this time, Samuel feels sorry for Saul, so he grants his request, but not before taking care of business. Verse 32. Then Samuel said, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully, and Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Samuel wants to tie up loose ends, so he calls for Agag, and Agag is cheerful. He feels no remorse. He thinks he's safe because Saul spared him. But from the very beginning of our passage, the prophet Samuel understood his mission. And so in what is possibly the most heavy metal passage in the Old Testament, Samuel says this in verse 33. As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. How does God respond to sin? Samuel knows that God judges sin and that God grieves sin. And so Samuel does what Saul failed to do. In a stunning picture of the consequences of sin, Samuel hacks Agag to pieces before the Lord. This bandit king who has made so many women childless, Samuel now makes his mother childless. As God's prophet, Samuel judges sin. And then Samuel goes home, and as God's prophet, Samuel grieves over Saul's sin. Because Samuel knows that just as Agag deserves judgment for opposing God's people, so too does Saul for opposing God. Verse today's passage is a sobering passage. In our own lives, we so often take Saul's approach to sin. 
We minimize it. We excuse it. We do this by twisting God's commands, by shifting blame, and by thinking that our good motives justify what we're doing. Like Saul, we can fail to see how serious sin is. I mean, how many celebrities, politicians, and pastors have we seen in recent news who worry only about the consequences of their sin and only once they're caught? And how many of us get caught in the same patterns? How often do we fail to take sin seriously? How often do we treat it lightly? And so if this is how we do respond to sin, then Bridge, how should we respond to sin? How should we respond to sin? The answer is that we need to respond to sin the way God responds to sin. We need to see sin the way that God sees it. As something that deserves both God's unregretting judgment and his regretful grief. Like Samuel, we need to grieve the sin we see and we need to be attentive to God's judgments. Because our injustice, our disobedience, it cries out for judgment from a just God who grieves sin. Brothers and sisters, don't forget that it's to satisfy this judgment that Jesus paid our penalty. It's to end the grief of sin that Christ died. Folks, as believers, we should never forget that Christ was crucified for our sins, that the punishment for sin was so great that only God himself could pay the cost on our behalf. That's how seriously God sees our sin and is how seriously we should see it. And so, Bridge, today, don't look at your sin the way Saul sees it. Look at your sin with God's eyes. Grieve your sin. Let's pray. Lord, you are a righteous and just God. Lord, we know that you, God, that you are righteously angry at the injustices that we are constantly perpetuating God, in our communities, in this world, in our homes. God, that you see our disobedience. You see the ways that we twist your word, that we don't hear what you say to us. That we know that we face your wrath, your judgment. That, Lord, on the final day, we will all have to answer for what we've done. Lord, we would despair of this. Lord, we would have no hope, we know, if it were not for the fact that you have shown us compassion and mercy, that you grieve our sin and that you made a way. God, help us to not forget that it was for our sins that Christ was crucified. Help us not to forget the, the grievousness of our sin. God, God the fact that, that it makes you God, so righteously disappointed and angry when we trample on your creation, when we mistreat your image bearers. God, teach us to see ourselves as you see us, to not be blind like King Saul was. God, to not try to scramble out of a corner if we think we're caught in it. But God, to own up to our sin, to confess our sin, to repent of our sin, to own up to it. And God, to turn to you, to turn to your loving arms. And help us to put sin to death. Lord, we stand here in fear and trembling, praying to you knowing that we deserve death. And yet aware, God, that in you we have life, which is a miracle that we will be singing praises of till eternity. But now, Lord, this week, I ask that you would convict our hearts of sin, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in us 
there would be no corner left unturned, that every spot of darkness in our lives would have your light shine on it. Awaken us to our sin, Lord. We pray this in the name of your sinless Son, Jesus Christ.